Hey, it's Latif from Radio Lab. Our goal with each episode is to make you think, how did I live this long and not know that? Radio Lab, adventures on the edge of what we think we know. Listen wherever you get podcasts. This is all of it on WNYC. I'm Kusha Navadar in for Allison Stewart. That's a live 1991 performance by Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes, who were the first house band at the legendary Stone Pony. Since it opened 50 years ago, it's been the anchor of the Asbury Park music scene. Now its story is told in a new book titled... I Don't Want to Go Home, The Oral History of the Stone Pony. The book includes interviews with Stephen Van Zandt, Southside Johnny, Patti Smith, the Jonas Brothers, Jack Antonoff, and other legendary musicians, including, of course, Bruce Springsteen, who wrote the foreword, as well as people like actor Russell Crowe and at least two former governors of New Jersey. In short, it's a comprehensive look at a place that is one of the most important music venues on the East Coast, if not the country. I Don't Want to Go Home is by Nick Corsiniti, and he joins us now. Hey, Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And listeners, we know you've got experiences to share, so we want to hear from you, too. What are your experiences with the Stone Pony? What's the most memorable performance you've seen there? Why isn't it an important place for you? Give us a call. We're at 212-433-9692. That's 212-433-WNYC. You can also text us at that number. Or if you have a memory about Asbury Park in the 1970s, you can share. Hit us up. We're at 212-433-9692 or DM us on socials we're on x and instagram we're at all of it wnyc so nick let's dive into it i gotta say you know today is publication day june 4th congratulations thank you and june 4th is a significant day in music history for it was on this date 40 years ago that this album was released your book is being released on the anniversary of bruce springsteen's best-selling album I'm going to call it uh, kismet, maybe. Okay. <laughs> Certainly not necessarily planned, but maybe, you know, in the cosmos, this is what it was always meant to be. Well, lovely. So uh, tell me, why an oral history? So a place like the Pony that's been around for so long, to me, is just filled with stories. Mm -hmm. And when you have so many people who've come through there, so many characters, like you were saying, who are in the book, from Bruce and Stevie and Southside to the Jonas Brothers to Zach Wilde to Russell Crowe, I felt like you want to hear from them, right? You want to hear their stories as they tell it. And when you weave it together in an oral history, I think you really get a sense. You get pulled inside the walls or even outside the walls in Asbury Park, as I try and do a few other times, in a way that normal prose I don't think can really convey. And it's just so fascinating to hear, you know, pretty much, you know, unedited from their mouths what the place was like. And so that's, I think, why an oral history was, was the best fit for a place that's just meant so much to so many people and seen so many different iterations of itself. Tell us a little bit about the process then. How many people did you re reach out to? How many hours of tape did you record? Oh, hours and probably weeks of tape, to be perfectly wow. honest. Um, there, I interviewed over uh, about like 170 people. Not everyone ended up making the, the final cut of the book. And there was over 200 interviews because I talked to a lot of people multiple times. You know, I talked to Springsteen twice. Um, I talked to Eileen Chapman, I think, the most. I think I interviewed her about eight times. Um, and, you know, it, it took a long time. I, this started as, a, as an article in the New York Times in 2018. Um, and my first draft that I filed to my editor um, was about 15,000 words, which is about, you know, 13,000 too much. <laughs> um, and I just really, and like all of it felt so vital. I mean, you always overfile, right? But like, I was like, there's more here. And I was actually talking to um, my former editor, who's, who's now the managing editor of the New York Times, Carolyn Ryan, and she was like, there's a book here. And so that's when we kind of started going down the road. So while it was a four and a half year journey, it really was a, a, a more like full time occupation for like the past year. What surprised you about these interviews? Did you feel like you got a diversity of opinions or was everyone just like, yeah, the Stone Pony's great? Well, I think you got a diversity of opinions as to why the Stone Pony 
helped them. But I don't think everyone was like, it's great, right? I, I, there was a really interesting interview I did with Dan Jacobson, who uh, runs a local newspaper in Asbury Park called the Tri-City News. And when Asbury was really struggling in the late 90s and early 2000s, and the people who were there were trying to start to build it back. So many people from out of town were like coming to the Stone Pony and leaving immediately. And he was like, you know, it started to bother me because our only reputation was we have this thing that people come to and leave. And they don't understand that there are people still living here and like, yes, it's bad, but we need to build it back. Mm. So there was a few people who were like, you know, I respect it for what it is, but I wish people saw what else was in Asbury Park. Yet, you know, so many artists are like playing there is different. It's not the way you would ever make a rock club now, right? Like most are long halls with a stage in the back and, you know, everyone can kind of get as close as they want and, you know, bars on the side. The pony is very wide, but very shallow. So for an artist, you really feel like the fans are on top of you. You know, and I was interviewing people who've played, at, like uh, Mike McCready from Pearl Jam. He's played every venue, you know, possible. They started in bars and basements, and now they play arenas. And he was like, it was so fascinating to be on that stage and looking out at a crowd that felt like it was on top of me that I could read their beer labels. Wow. And that was not something I'd felt in forever. So I think it, it, it feels different, but similarly important to so many different artists. Um and that really, I think, came across as I was talking to them. Listeners, if you have an experience with the Stone Pony, we want to hear from you. What's your most memorable performance you've seen there? Have you had an artist who is able to read your beer can while you were watching them perform? Give us a call or at 212-433-9692. Nick, we've got some calls in. I'd love to take Jeanette from Denver. Hey, Jeanette, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. What's your experience with the Stone Pony? Uh, well, I'm from Spring Lake, a few towns away from Asbury Park. I would go there when I was 18. I would see Bruce sitting at the bar in the back bar, just having a beer, and eventually he would get up and start jamming with Southside Johnny and the Jukes. Um, it was awesome. I uh, also saw Bob Skaggs play there. Um, it was a safe, fun environment. I have five brothers, and one night all of us were there, and I... I think we got home at 4 a.m. It was the best time and cheap and uh, a great environment. Wonderful. Jeanette, thank you so much for that call. We've also got Mike in Manhattan. Hey, Mike, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for taking my call. I um, I grew up in Jersey near Asbury Park in the 60s and 70s and went to see many great shows at the Stone Pony and, and a lot of other important venues that were in Asbury then. The, the, the city was starting to decline, but there were still still a lot of great places to see music. Wonderful. Mike, thank you so much for that. And, you know, I love that you mentioned the, 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 the evolution of both Asbury Park and the Stone Pony, because the book is really a history of both the Stone Pony and Asbury Park. Both have had booms and busts. Can you, Nick, tell us how they're intertwined? Yeah, as I've always said, the, the whole reason I wanted to do this book about the Stone Pony was because I wanted to tell the story of Asbury Park's renaissance. You know, it's it's really come back if you're there now. Um, and it's a relationship that's not a mirror, but they're deeply interwoven. So, you know, as Asbury was starting to decline in, in the late 80s, and it was, you know, struggling like a lot of small towns where industry was leaving, developers were making the kind of wrong bets, and local governments were kind of beholden to them, it starts to crater. And as it cratered, it started to drag the pony down with it. But I think because of the Springsteen and Southside and, and national acts like she mentioned, Boz Skaggs coming, it still was a little bit more resilient um, in that late 80s kind of first Nadir. But then in the late 90s, when it really got bad, um, you know, it bottomed out and the pony couldn't withstand it. And it also closed for more than two years before it was reopened. Um, and as it started coming back in 2000 with Dominic Santana as the owner, um, Asbury slowly started to come back. And so it, it is this kind of interwoven relationship where one, I don't want to say one can't succeed without the other, but they really do kind of depend on each other in a way that I don't think a lot of venues have that same relationship with a town. Right. And, and you know, one part of the history of Asbury Park that I found interesting, I think probably a lot of people have forgotten is how segregated Asbury Park was and how that led to even riots in, in 1970. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. Um, so the town of Asbury Park is almost divided by train tracks and the east side of town, which is closer to the ocean, um, was mostly white, upper middle class, um, especially in the 60s. And then on the west side uh, was a mostly black neighborhood. Um, but it was 
also thriving neighborhoods. Springwood Avenue um, was a main street that had jazz clubs that all of the legends played at. Ella Fitzgerald, you know, Sam and Dave. They all played there, and it led to an intermingling of musicians mm. in a way that would eventually impact how Bruce Springsteen wrote his music. You know, Gary Talent was over in those clubs playing bass with some of those artists. Uh, Vinny Lopez wasn't old enough to get in, so he would just stand outside and listen. But the economic opportunities on the east side were quickly dwindling for people on the west side. And that led to a lot of tension in the 1970s. And, you know, this was something that was happening in a lot of towns and cities, you know, across the country at that time. I mean, in, in Newark right before then was, you know, a much bigger and, and, and unfortunately much more tragic um, riot. But in the summer of 1970, it, it erupted into um, riots that destroyed the west side of town mm. where, you know, the, the largely black population lived. And it it really decimated that neighborhood and it's still struggling to come back um you know and it started a lot of flight out of asbury park into ocean it kind of doomed the schools um and it you know left this once booming resort that was you know a destination for people from new york city um kind of in question Listeners, we're, we're talking about the Stone Pony, the, the venerated music venue in Asbury Park and, and the city of Asbury Park itself. We're talking to Nick Corsiniti about his new book. Today's publishing day. It's called I Don't Want to Go Home, The Oral History of the Stone Pony. We're taking your calls and your texts. We're at 212-433-9692. That's 212-433-WNYC. If you've got a memory of the Stone Pony or a memory of Asbury Park from the 70s, give us a call. Send us a text. 212-433-9692. I'm going to read out some texts, then we'll go to a call. Here's a text that said, I remember the riots seeming a plume of smoke over the city, still a very segregated city. We've got another text that says the Pony and AP are forever linked to Jersey Shore legend. Please come visit us this summer. We are the Gold Coast of Northeastern U.S. And then two smiley emojis. So shout out to the Gold Coast of the Northeastern U.S. We've also got Peggy from Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Hey, Peggy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, I grew up in the area and uh, my sister was a regular on Sunday nights at the Stone Pony this would be the early to mid eighties when cats on a smooth service would be playing and Bruce often showed up unannounced. And so my sister was coming back from the bathroom, making her way to the stage and we grew up in the bar business. So she knew how to part a crowd. So she's weaving her way through, but she gets stuck. And all of a sudden she feels someone on her shoulder saying, no, no, don't stop. Keep going. And she turns around and it's Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> trying to make his way to the stage to just jump up and surprise the crowd that night. Peggy, that's such a cool story. Thank you so much. Uh, Nick, uh, you know, I listen to Peggy and I think uh, there, there are probably so many local stories. How many locals did you talk to as a part of this? Oh, dozens. Um, you know, from bartenders to just patrons to um, bouncers. Uh, there were just so many people had these stories and these personal interactions with you know, Bruce Springsteen or Stevie Van Zandt or Southside Johnny. And they're just like that, like in the crowd in a way that's almost unfathomable now, right? Like Bruce, especially after Born in the USA comes out, he's one of the most famous people in the world, right? It's like him and Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. So imagine now if Taylor Swift just started going to a small bar, like the the frenzy that would happen after that. And it was happening on a weekly basis, as, as, as she mentioned, with Cats in a Smooth Surface, summer of 1982. Bruce was there almost every Sunday. It was never billed. He never, you know, was paid or, or anything like that. Um, but it was this this randomness and this spontaneity that created this, you know, addiction to the place. And, and everyone had those those moments with, you know, a, a real rock star. You know, you mentioned Southside Johnny. The book's title comes from a Southside Johnny and the Asbury Juke song. And I think we deserve one more Southside Johnny song before we go to break. Here he is performing the song. It's been a long time with Steve Van Zant. And This is all of it on WNYC. I'm Kusha Navidar, and we are here with Nick Corsiniti talking about frequented this legendary music venue. Listeners, we're also taking your calls and your texts, 212-433-9692, if you've got a memory about either the city or the Stone Pony itself. Now, Nick, lest anyone think that the music that gets played at the Stone Pony is limited to classic rock, let's offer a corrective. The Jonas Brothers have performed at the Stone Pony, and you interviewed them for your 
your book, actually. They, they first played before they were 18 years old. So tell us about it. Yeah, so it's a, a little known story in, in pony history is that before the Jonas Brothers were signed or anything, you know, they were just another band that was trying to make it in New Jersey. And they inked a gig at the pony, but there's rules that, you know, you either have to be over 18 or 21 if you're going to play late, if there's liquor being served. So they had to play a little bit earlier in the day. It wasn't a sellout. So this is, you know, mid to, I think it was 2005, Asbury Park. It's coming back, but the boardwalk's still a slightly dangerous place. And here's, you know, these younger teen Jonas Brothers running around with flyers being like, please come to our show. Uh, you know, they said that when they were playing, they were getting heckled a little bit by some of the people in the back who were like, what is going on here? Um, but, you know, it was right before they would take off. And uh, there's actually a picture in the book of them playing as as very young artists wearing, you know, like Tiger Beat shirts. Um, and so when they uh, when the VMAs came back to New Jersey, uh, they wanted to go back to the Pony and Asbury Park and and play there because it meant something to them. They have I think a lot of New Jersey artists actually have this connection to their home, this roots, even artists who would move away like the Lumineers. Right. They're thought of as a, as a Colorado band. But Wes is from New Jersey. And as soon as you start talking to him about it, it flows out. And there's something I think about being a musician from this state, as Southside called it, the joke state, um, that, you know, it it's just a deep root and a deep pride that's always there no matter who the artist is. And the Jonas Brothers are another example of that. And, you know, it's it's interesting. Like you said, they made their triumphant return at the 2019 MTA uh, mu- Video Music Awards and they performed live at the Stone Pony. Let's listen to them from that performance. Here they are pl- live at the 2019 MTV VMAs from the Stone Pony. I said MTA before. They were not playing on the A train or something. And I got to say, Nick, it, it, you know, we're talking about this during the break. It is so vibrant and visceral to hear those live recordings and the way that you described the stage where it was shallow and wide. You can you can see, you can feel the energy almost. I want to go to a caller, Dan in Point Pleasant, New Jersey. Hey, Dan, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for taking my call. Appreciate it. Absolutely. What's your memory? So I just wanted to give a shout out to the Stone Pony uh, summer stage. I've been to sh- some shows inside, but uh, the summer stage they open up in the summertime uh, is also super cool. I'm, I'm, what, uh, I'm in my early 30s, what some might call an elder emo. Um, and I've seen some really, really fun uh, post-hardcore and pop-punk shows there. It's kind of been a staple of the summer. Um, I go every year. I have a couple shows planned this year. Um, it's just a really cool vibe, really cool venue, and uh, this is a great conversation. I'm really enjoying hearing more about it. Dan, thank you so much. Uh, elder emo respect. Gotta love that. Nick, your experience with the Stone Pony starts with Jersey's punk scene. Tell us about it. It does. My first concert ever, actually, was the Warp Tour in 1998 with my dad um which was held in the stone pony lot and i grew up in the new jersey punk scene which was taking place in basements and church halls and legion halls and it was very diy but it was so influential to what would become modern emo i mean my chemical romance you know comes from there and they now sell out arenas um bands like brand new taking back sunday if they're not from jersey they were playing in jersey the starting line midtown Midtown is from Jersey. Um, all of these bands were playing there, and the Pony was our big stage, you know, and, and eventually we got Starland Ballroom. Um, but that's kind of what drew me in initially. I, I was obviously young and, and uh, very into punk. I loved Bruce growing up in New Jersey, but punk was what was guiding me there and what, what brought me there um, to see bands like Less Than Jake, Catch 22, Blink 182 before they were very big. Um, you know, it was a it was a it was a great place to see a show, and you know, it was funny because as I was mentioning, it's a weirdly laid out thing. So in these shows where you know pits are and crowd surfing is is part of the experience, it's very different when a pit forms in a very shallow crowd, right, <laughs> versus like a deep <laughs> thing. So there was numerous times you caught a stray, you know, elbow or a shoot of the head or anything like that. Um, But it just made it all the more special. Well, you know, Dan, who just called us before, I want to give out a shout out to you for using the phrase elder emo. And I think that it's a great segue into the next clip that we have. Let's listen to one of the bands that you, Nick, talked about, the Bouncing Souls. Here they are playing Ghosts on the Boardwalk. (laughs) 
Ghosts on the Boardwalk. We're talking to Nick Corsiniti about his book, I Don't Want to Go Home, The Oral History of the Stone Pony. And we're taking your calls, listeners, about your memories of the Stone Pony or of Asbury Park. Give us a call. We're at 212-433-9692. That's 212-433-WNYC. Nick, the Stone Pony seems to be musically heterodox. Like, yes, there are the Jersey greats like Springsteen and Southside Johnny, Bon Jovi, etc. But they book punk acts, they book rappers, they book folks that we just listen to. How did how did the Stone Pony survive longer term? It feels like it circled the drain several times, like you mentioned, actually filed for bankruptcy in the 90s. It closed, it, it reopened. How did they weather all of those storms? Well, sometimes they didn't, uh, as you know, they, they closed twice. But I think what's really interesting is, you know, in the first iteration of the Pony from 74 to 91, it was like a neighborhood bar with a good stage. And it was where Bruce Springsteen was playing and Southside Johnny and you had these house bands and you had this scene that was so vibrant. But as they got older and as the city started to kind of crumble, that faded away. And, and you know, it's, I guess, the bottoming out and the end of that was when it closed in 91. It quickly was bought and reopened, but it was very different. It became a music venue. It was no longer open seven days a week. It didn't have live music seven days a week. You couldn't just go in and get a beer. It was now a venue. And, you know, a guy named Tony Palagrossi saw music changing. And what's funny is he was once in the Asbury Jukes. So he was playing oh. in the Pony in, the, you know, the late 70s. And then he became a music promoter. And the music that they started playing in the 90s was what was working in the 90s. It was alternative rock. It was punk. It was jam. There was, you know, Mo and, and bands that were really big in the 90s jam scene were playing there all the time. In part because, and I kind of love this idea... Punk and jam have fans that are fearless for very different reasons. You know, punk fans, they're fine with violence. They live on the edge. They're going to go anywhere. You know, CBGB's was open. It wasn't in the best area. You still went and saw your shows. And jam fans will go where the music is. They'll follow the dead into the desert, mm -hmm. but they'll go, right? So punk and jam is kind of what really kept the pony alive in the 90s. When it closes, just kind of due to everything in 98, and it reopens in 2000 with Dominic Santana, it blends that, you know, it brings back Bruce and John Eddie and Southside and, and, you know, music that had, had made it, you know, what it was, but it still stayed true to, I think the music that was getting popular. Emo was becoming very big at the pony at that time. Um, and it's kind of used that mix all the way to this day. Wow. We've got some texts and uh, a call. I want to read this text. I think it's an interesting question. You might be able to answer. What was the best band out of that area that never really quote unquote made it? Oh, wow. Um, I, I'll go with uh, I'll go with a band called Lord Gunner. Um, they were fronted by a guy named Lance Larson. Um, it's you know kind of tough to find recordings. I wasn't alive when they were you know at, at their um, at their peak, but they were playing the pony and they were packing it out in a way that was bringing a lot of locals. Um, who were fervent fans of the band. And Lance Larson was such a front man. He would do all sorts of crazy stuff. There's stories in the book about him breaking glass on his head in the middle of songs. And then he grew an afro and he was getting glass caught in it and trying to pull it out and was cutting his hands, but he didn't care. That's how hard he played. And, you know, they got signed. Um, there was a couple bands that would get signed in the late 70s on that kind of, uh, you know, coattails of the Springsteen uh, sound. And they never really made it out of Asbury Park, but they were still really really good um and so i think that would probably be it from that era um from the punk era i mean there's just so many bands that like are still beloved in the state that you know either broke up or you know just never really kind of caught on i think of one called lane meyer um that i loved going to see and you know uh, jack antonoff who was actually in a punk band before bleachers um, called The Outline. He was in a lot of those basement shows that I was talking about earlier. And he, there's a picture that Lane Meyer just put up of Jack Antonoff in the crowd with like Gosh. dyed blonde hair. And he's using, you know, I think he, in a recent interview, he's like, I'm going to use some of their lyrics for an upcoming song. Um, but there's, you know, there's so when you have a local venue that even when you're just doing national acts, but you're allowing local bands to either do battles with the bands or open up for big ones. That's a big thing the Pony does now is local artists get to open up for major artists. So um, a guy I love right now, Bobby Mahoney, you know, I think he he's playing sometime next week. Um, you know, he he's opened up for some major bands like Bon Jovi. Mm. Um, and it's got that kind of still tied to the local scene and still promoting the national acts, too. Well, we've got time for one more caller. Let's go to Tim in Bridgewater, New Jersey. Hey, Tim, welcome to the show. 
Hey, hi. How are you? Thanks for taking my call. So this is a great show. I'm really enjoying it. So I'm a little bit older probably than the typical uh, emo person. I'm a 58-year-old that got into it kind of later in life from my eldest son. <laughs> and um, uh, all this talk about uh, the, the Stone Pony is, is really cool. I'm, act I'm actually now going to a show on the 12th to see the used. I'm a huge used fan. And um, um, I've been saw them there twice before and just this summer stage thing has been amazing so this is just really really fun to hear so i just appreciate uh, this show to tim thank you so much i appreciate you calling in there's a text that just came through that i'd like to read it says also while i appreciate the music saved asbury park slogan it does not speak to the fact that gay bars and black bars kept asbury park going when the city was uh when the city was in some of its worst years of struggle so thank you so much listeners for doing that that is a really important part of the history as well right nick it's a crucial part of the history you know you see all the shirts that say music saved asbury park and that's an important part of the spirit but it never would have had the opportunity to save Asbury Park if it wasn't for the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. They came to Asbury when, you know, there was nothing there and, and invested and built a community there that was so open and welcoming and kept it coming. And it's, it's still vibrant to this day. Like the Pride Parade in Asbury is a massive citywide event. You know, we closed down streets. Um, it, it, it's such an important part of Asbury's history and culture, you know, to this day. Yeah. Well, let's go out on some music. As we talked about earlier, today is the 40th anniversary of the release of Born in the USA. Here's a clip. We're going to play it in a second of uh, Bruce playing at the Stone Pony. But before we go to that, I just want to say, Nick, thank you so much for joining us. The book is I Don't Want to Go Home, The Oral History of the Stone Pony. It's by Nick Corasiniti. Today was publishing day. Nick, thank you so much. Thank you. And if I could just say one more quick thing, we're throwing a massive party at the Stone Pony um, this Saturday. That's going to be like everything in the book. We're going to have a house band. There's going to be special guest appearances. Some that are, are not billed. Others are from great bands like Skid Row, the Gaslight Anthem, Bouncing Souls, the Smithereens. Mark Ribbler from the Disciples of Souls is leading the music. Uh, it's going to be a blast. It's going to be like everything we talk about in the book. And, um, you know, we'd love to see you there. And can you say one more time when that is? It is Saturday, June 8th, 7 p.m., Music at 8. Wonderful. So that was Nick Corsiniti. We're going to go out on some music as we talked about. Today was the 40th anniversary of Born in the USA. Here's a clip of a show Bruce played at the Stone Pony four days later, June 8th, 1984, in what was a surprise show. And while many people didn't know for sure Bruce would show up, they were sure glad that he did, as you'll hear from the crowd singing along. Let's listen. 